Hello. So today I'm going to walk you through kind of lesson lecture style, uh, the key points from the revision list. So imagine we're in a room and this is the stuff I'm writing on the board and you write it down. Thought this might be easier than just sending you the PowerPoint, might be more interesting and more familiar, more like a real lesson uh, for you to maybe watch this and then jot down the points. Obviously, if you've got the stuff already written down from Monday's revision, just add anything extra to you. You don't have to redo the same bullet points. So uh, ecology revision. So the first thing is the definition for abiotic and biotic factors, what they are and how you could measure them. So abiotic, they're the non-living parts of an environment, of an ecosystem. So that's things like light intensity and you can measure it with a light meter. Temperature, thermometer. Moisture levels, hydrometer. You can get the general gist here that a lot of these just have the word meter stuck on the end of them. So a pH and mineral content, yeah, you can use a pH probe. I know you've used that in chemistry before, the little red thing to measure pH. Wind intensity and direction, an anemometer and a wind sock. I think you might even get away with wind meter if in a panic. Carbon dioxide level for plants, difficult to measure. I, I've never seen that asked before. And I'm in the way. Hey. And oxygen levels for aquatic animals. Here's quite interesting. The way that you measure oxygen levels without some kind of special bit of equipment is by what bugs are in the water. Some species of bugs need really clean water. Clean water has lots of oxygen. Vice versa, some species can only live actually if it's very badly polluted and there's very, very low levels of oxygen. So you can measure it with the bug species that are in the water. Biotic factors are kind of the opposite. They are the living things about that area, that environment. So how much food is available? Are there new predators? Are there new pathogens to make them sick and spread diseases? Um, are there one species out competing another to the point where there's not enough numbers for them to be able to successfully breed? An example of this in the UK is grey squirrels out competing red squirrels. So now they're actually confined red squirrels mostly to very small pockets um, of the United Kingdom. Some definitions of keywords. I'm going to be moving all over the place. An ecosystem, it's the interaction of a community of organisms, living things with the non-living uh, parts of the environment. So it's the living and the non-living things working together. Community is all the living species together. So that includes, remember, plants alive. I say that quite often, but the amount of people who still question whether plants are alive, slightly concerning. Um, so that plants and animals, the number of them, that's all a community. Population is how much of a given species. So how many oak trees are in this area? How many foxes are in this area? That's population. Habitat, where they live. Interdependence, one species depending on another. So a lot of species rely on trees for shelter or food. Uh, some species rely on others for food. Some species rely on um, others to keep other predators away, things like that. And then finally, the biodiversity is the variety of all the different species of organisms on Earth or within an ecosystem. So high biodiversity is good, means there's lots of places, lots of different habitats for lots of different creatures. Low biodiversity is bad because then you're limited in what can survive there. A stable community is where where all the species and environmental factors are in balance so that the population size remains constant. Now, when we say constant, we mean constant over a long period of time. In the shorter term, things will naturally fluctuate. And one example of this is prey and predator cycles. Oh, I hate my face being in the way. So natural that numbers will go up and down. And there's some reasons for this. So these are four main stages in the cycle. When prey numbers are high, lots of food for predators, the predator population can increase because there's plenty of food. However, that predator increase, as there gets more predators, they will eat more prey and the prey number will come down. 
Without enough food, because the prey number has just calmed down, the predators will start competing and some of them will die from starvation. That will decrease the predators. And as the predators decrease, that gives the prey a chance to recover. They live longer, they can breed more. And the prey numbers go up. And this cycle just repeats and repeats and repeats. Hopefully, if nothing disturbs it, forever. Okay. So these are adaptations for a hot or dry climate. This is one of the uh, sort of habitats that they might ask about. But when it comes to adaptations, quite often they will give you a random situation or a random animal. They'll tell you a little bit about it or a plant. Quite often they do plants as well because they're maybe not as obvious as animals. They will give you maybe a picture a situation and say how is this animal adapted to so for example in the past i've seen like a gazelle or an antelope would say how is this animal adapted to escape from predators things like long legs to help them run away antlers to help them defend themselves so it could be that you just have to make sensible suggestions about a situation you haven't heard about before but in terms of what it, common environments hot, dry, and cold are sort of the main ones that have come up. So in hot places, it's all about uh, keeping cool and not losing water. So thin fur uh, stores less heat, light fur radiates heat, large ears, uh, larger surface area to volume ratio, which radiates the heat. The key bit about answering a question about adaptations is explaining the adaptation. It's not just enough to say it has this, it has this, it has this you also need to say how that is useful. So quite uh, this is quite a common six mark question in the second biology paper is to write about adaptations. You need to explain them to get you know, into the, the higher marks. Nocturnal, when it's colder at night, they hunt, they are active. And com some of them have quite cool adaptations, cool being interesting rather than cool being cold um, to stop them losing water so some animals don't sweat at all and some animals uh, desert rat produces solid urine they don't lose any water at all uh, plants again need to keep the water so instead of leaves they've got spines like a cactus which reduces its surface area so it loses water if they don't have spines they tend to have very very small leaves Excuse me. They have deep and wide roots, so when there is rain, they can access as much as possible or access water that's way buried deep underground. And thick stems, again, stops water that's trapped on the inside from escaping, from evaporating. Cold adaptations, most of these are to keep warm or in plants to get water because in cold places, water is frozen most of the year, so actually plants need to have very similar adaptations to hot places so that they can keep the water that they have um, otherwise they die so animals they've got thick fur to insulate them white fur for camouflage large feet so they can walk on the snow without sinking into it or ice without cracking it sort of spread their way out blubber for insulating them uh, smaller ears so they have a smaller surface area to volume ratio which means they lose less heat they hibernate, so they sleep through the coldest parts of the year when most uh, food isn't available. Plants, needles, dead leaves, conserve heat. I meant to say conserve water, but it's too late to go back now. So please, um, hold on, let me. I have terrible computer handwriting and it's disappeared. Okay, right, that's something I'm not doing again. A thick cuticle, again, stops water evaporating and they tend to grow much shorter than trees and other parts of the world so that they're not damaged by the really bitter, harsh, cold winds that uh, would damage them very easily. Extremophiles are examples of organisms that are adapted for very harsh, extreme climates. Um, this bit, often from the Archaea domain, 
that will make more sense at a later date. Um, usually at this point we will have done evolution and genetics. We haven't done that because we decided that was very difficult to do from home, whereas this one makes a little more common sense in theory. Um, so that will come back. That's an important and a reason I've stuck it in there is because that's a question I've already seen two questions ask about extremophiles and their domain, which you'll learn about later, uh, on like three years of papers. So I thought I'd include it. An example of this is bacteria in thermal vents. I've just picked a random example of Yellowstone Park. They've got special enzymes that don't denature even when the water is very hot or extremes of acid or alkaline. Whether it's acid or alkaline depends on like what type of rock that the geyser is near. Uh, yeah, food chains. Uh, you just need to be able to label uh, levels in a food chain. So your green thing starts a food chain and that is your producer. Don't be thrown if they give you a water environment or a water ecosystem. It will start with algae. Algae is for all intent and purpose a plant even though it's not quite but it's a producer it makes its own energy its own glucose through photosynthesis next level is the primary consumer it's the first level in the chain that eats something producers don't eat they make their glucose from sunlight in photosynthesis consumers eat to get their glucose and their energy secondary consumer is the next one that eats tertiary is the next one that eats I've never seen this come up in a question, but quite a few, oh no, go back. Quite a few pictures have like five different links. The top one is called a quaternary consumer or fourth level. However many links it has, so whether it stops at tertiary or it goes on to quaternary, whatever one is at the top can also become an A or be called an apex predator. That means nothing hunts it. It's pretty much safe. Um, so yeah, there's a question that does come up, excuse me, I'm in the way, there we go, uh, as about the size of food chains. So the smaller a food chain, the more energy gets passed along because between each link in the food chain, there is room for energy being lost in that organism doing something. So here we have if we just ate potatoes, although that wouldn't be nutritionally very good for us, we would get more energy than if we just ate meat. Because to, for us to eat meat, it's got to go through more links than for us to eat vegetable material. But there's other reasons we have a varied diet, and that's because of all the nutrients that we need, not just energy. So reasons why links lose energy is because quite often those animals, well, they'll be doing it all the time, they'll be respiring and that will generate heat that's lost to the environment. They'll generate movement, which will use energy. And they also get rid of carbon dioxide, which is part of respiration. There'll be bits that they can't eat. So bones and feathers, uh, they won't be able to digest them. They won't be able to eat them probably. So any energy used in making those bones and making those feathers, is lost and then waste bits that they can't digest even if they can eat it um lost as poo feces and urine so those are all ways that energy gets lost between links in a food chain your two experiments about using a quadrat first one is how to estimate population size so imagine you've got a field and without sitting there and counting every single flower how could you use quadrats to estimate the size. So you do something like this. You randomly set down quadrats, small uh, metal frames, and count the whatever you're counting that's inside them. Now you need to be sure that you are being random. So either quick method is just sort of spin around with your eyes closed and throw it, or over your shoulder. And this is the reason you want to do this is so that you're not biased. If you decide you want to count all the things in the field, but only stick your quadrats in one small place, you're not getting a fair representation 
across the whole field. So your estimate will probably be very wrong. The other way to do it is to, if you've got maybe a massive area, is divide it up into a grid and then use some kind of app or number generator to pick out random coordinates that you go and have a look at. Once you've put the quadrant down, you count it and then you repeat that many, many, many times. Usually in science, we say the minimum is three. When you're counting population, minimum is like 10 and it will also depend on the size of the area. It's a massive area. You're going to have to take a lot of results to get a fair representation. And then once you've got your set of results, you take a mean. All the numbers added up divided by how many times you did it. And then final thing, you then take your mean value per quadrat and then work out how many quadrats you could fit on your field or your area. And don't be thrown. Sometimes they give you weird shapes and you've got to use some math skills. Like I've seen like a semi, a triangle on top of another of a rectangle and you have to do a bit of math skills to work out area first before you then do this next bit. So mean value per quadrat, how many quadrats can you get on that field and multiply that number by your mean. Transect still uses quadrats, but rather than randomly trying to chuck it on a field to see how many stuff, how much stuff's there, we're now seeing does uh, a population change as we move from one area into another. So I've given you an example here from a past paper question, and it is sort of uh, sampling going away from the sea. So is there any change in the kind of things we find as we go further and further away from the sea? Now that could be things, the thing about the environment that could be changing is it could be getting warmer as you get away from the sea, it could be getting less windy, uh, it could be getting less water, it could be getting less salt. So there could be many, many things changing but you can use a transect, which is a tip measure and quadrats to sample. So they're placed at regular intervals rather than randomly now we're picking like every meter or every two meters and we're setting the quadrat down at those regular gaps. And then we compare what we find to some other factor. How much light was in that first area? How much water was in that first area? Okay, how much water and light is here? Does that impact what we find there? And so on. And then to repeat it, because you repeat all experiments, rather than doing it again in that same place, you move it down the beach a little, or down the field a little, or down, I can't think of another place uh, right now. But yes, you repeat it just further along from where you did it the first time. Okay, carbon cycle. So this is how carbon moves from one part of an ecosystem to another. When answering a question on this, as was shown in the questions, they will give you diagrams that you may not have seen before. What you then need to do is work out first where the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is. Personally, I think that's the easiest place to start from. So CO2 in the atmosphere and then into plants. This is the process of photosynthesis changing carbon in form of carbon dioxide to carbon in the form of glucose. If you remember from the photosynthesis topic, glucose is C6H12O6, lots of carbon and glucose. Plants then, they need energy to live and to survive and to do many things. So they will use that glucose in respiration and give out CO2, which takes it back up to the atmosphere. Plants, no, animals also will break down glucose and release CO2 in respiration as well. Uh, when plants and when animals die in certain circumstances under intense heat and pressure over a very, very long time, millions of years, the right conditions can turn their carbon material into gas, oil, and coal, which can then be dug up and combusted to release energy that we can use as humans, 
um, but also uh, it releases quite a lot of carbon dioxide gas. Things that plants make that are carbon based, uh, glucose, obviously, but DNA has carbon, proteins all have carbon, fats all have carbon, cellulose has carbon, pretty much anything in a living being has some link to carbon. So when that plant is eaten, the carbon material, so the glucose, the proteins, all of that, will then end up in the animal. We then have an alternative direction to fossilization if they die. So when plants get rid of leaves or when they die or they lose petals or it falls off and gets broken, that material is then decomposed. Same for if an animal dies or it gets rid of waste, its feces, its urine. It's decomposed by decomposers. Those are things like bacteria and fungi. Those bacteria and fungi that are decomposing, that are breaking down the dead and the waste material into much, much smaller chemicals that can then be recycled. So minerals, other nutrients can be recycled into the soil or into the air. The carbon is recycled into the air, not by the dead stuff, but by the microorganisms. So as they break down the stuff, they're getting nutrients, they're getting glucose, they're getting other useful bits that they can use in respiration and they convert it into carbon dioxide, which goes back up into the atmosphere. There are two ways in which this cycle is kind of in balance in our world today. And that's here. Plants and trees are being cut down a lot more than they're being planted. So there's a reduction in photosynthesis, meaning there is more CO2 in the atmosphere. Same for combustion. Fossilization takes millions of years and is happened and we are digging up out of the ground and burning it at a vastly quicker rate. So that is also causing a buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. So that's why it's out of balance and that is having a lot of knock-on effects, which we'll discuss in a moment. Your water cycle here, I'm in the way. Here you really only have sort of keywords to identify. So oceans and lakes, uh, the sun heats them up and the water evaporates. That water becomes water vapor. Water vapor is quite light. It's less dense than air and it begins to rise. And as it rises, it cools and condenses, forming small water droplets in the air, condensation, and those form clouds. Also evaporation from oceans and as well as oceans and lakes evaporating you've also got evaporation from plants itself and that is called transpiration when the water vapor in clouds rises even more to get over say land masses such as uh, mountains it rises even more and it gets even colder and then those small droplets of water they come together to form bigger droplets and that then is much heavier and falls as rain. We call that precipitation. Rain that falls on the ground, uh, falls on roads, falls on and ends up in sewer systems, it all ends up back eventually into either plants or into oceans and lakes and rivers. And that is called either, I've seen both of these words, so I put them in, percolation or runoff. And that's the water cycle. A couple of key words. And then you have the last couple of bits that were in last Thursday's lesson. And these slides are basically just lifted from that because that gap fill I gave you was basically the bare bones of this last bit of ecology topic. So waste management. Uh, waste needs to be properly managed, otherwise it can have a knock-on effect on its environment. So that's things like water pollution from sewage, fertilizer, and toxic chemicals. There's a process which you learned about called eutrophication, where fertilizers end up in water. All the plants and algae in the water suddenly go a bit mad because they've got all this nutrients and have what's called an algae bloom. That covers the water in completely, and it means sunlight can't get to the plants at the bottom. They die as they decompose, 
all the bacteria in the water, decomposing them, use up all the oxygen. And then without oxygen, all the rest of the stuff in the river dies. And that can be a very difficult process to sort of reset. You've got air pollution from your smoke and your acidic gases can lead to acid rain. I know you've covered quite a lot of this in chemistry as well. So this is there's a very big link here uh, between chemistry and biology. And land pollution. So landfills, uh, chemical dumps that can then pollute the land with uh, ion, heavy metal ions and things like that. Using our land properly. So one example that they quote in the specification is um, peat bogs. So peat bogs are uh, basically a special type of soil that's very, very rich and can be dried and used as a fuel source. And it was very, very commonly um, burned, especially in places like Ireland. I learned a lot about this in my GCSE geography in Ireland. Um, but to get it, you need to dig up the land and completely destroy it, which removes habitats and specialist plant species, meaning that animals uh, and have lost their habitat and other knock-on effects. Also, when you burn peat, uh, you release carbon dioxide, which contributes to the greenhouse effect. Deforestation, this also comes under land use. So de deforestation happens for a reason. They don't just do it for and giggles. Uh, so provide land for cattle or rice fields, so for farming and agriculture, uh, to grow crops for biofuels or for wood as a fuel source, or for timber use in construction or manufacturing. However, this leads to reduced photosynthesis, so there's less carbon dioxide taken out of the atmosphere, and increased CO2 when wood is burnt as a result. So this is the same two negative side effects as the carbon cycle. Less photosynthesis means less O2 taken out of the air, increased CO2 when it's burnt. So you've got two reasons there why more CO2 is ending up in the atmosphere than it should be. And that can lead to global warming. So again, I know you've covered this probably in physics as well, or if you haven't, you probably will. All the carbon dioxide leads to this kind of like blanket which lets heat in from the sun, but then doesn't let it out again. So you end up with this very, very gradual increase in warming over many, many years. And here is a list. Now this wasn't in your, oh, and as well as carbon dioxide, also methane is a big contributor to carb to the global, glo yeah, to global warming. And there's a couple of knock-on effects. This wasn't, I accidentally let this off. This wasn't in your video, video, PowerPoint, but effects that global warming can have. Increased floods and droughts, depending on where you are in the world. Because of the increased floods and droughts, you've got famine, therefore, because the food source is now unreliable because your weather patterns are changing. Increased forest fires. If you're going to say this, don't just say forest fires on their own. Forest fires are a natural part of some ecosystems. Uh, some places in the world, uh, some bits of America, some bits of Australia, forest fires are natural and help keep the ecosystem in its normal cycle. However, much bigger forest fires like what we saw last year in Australia are damaging. And a reduction of habitat because of these forest fires or because of ice caps melting, a reduction of habitat can lead to extinction of species and a reduction in biodiversity. And then the last bullet point that I will leave you with is ways to maintain biodiversity. So all of these negative things have been happening because of human action. What can we now do to try and stop or even reverse those changes in our ecosystems? So endangered species breeding programs through zoos or through sort of nature reserves. Protection and regeneration of rare habitats, so putting restrictions on areas, um, like having big national parks where you're like, nothing can happen in here, no cutting down trees, no destroying anything or taking anything away, no quarrying, this is a safe site. Um, or taking an area that was maybe used and actively trying to encourage rare species to grow there. So repurposing an abandoned quarry.
things like that. Reintroducing hedgerows and field margins. This is quite a weird one, but it's a thing. If you go back a hundred years, farming was very much very, very small farms, but lots of them. Over the last couple of hundred years, farms have been bought out by big companies. Um, and what they do is rather than having small farms that are bordered by hedges, which provide shelter and food uh, for lots of small animals, what they do is they'd merge all the small farms into one big farm, get rid of all the hedges and just make massive, massive, massive fields where they only grow one type of crop. So you've lost all your hedges for, for habitat. And you've also now, because you're only growing one thing, it's very unlikely that you're able to support a diverse uh, range because bugs and birds, they're all going to eat the crops as well. But if you're only growing one crop, then that's only going to support a very limited amount of creatures. Reducing deforestation and carbon dioxide emissions by programs. Uh, governments now get fined by world organizations if they don't meet their carbon dioxide uh, targets. Uh, places get fined if they cut down too much forest. Um, and then recycling rather than dumping. So programs and encouraging reusing and repurposing things rather than just putting everything in landfill. Ooh. That's a nice side. Okay, uh, go away. Right, so that is your basic summary. If you have got this far, well done. Take any notes that you've made, excuse me, from this video and take a picture of them. Next week, what I'll be doing is we'll be doing some practice questions and then in a following lesson, uh, because there's a few with some of you going back into school uh, on various days there are there's a little bit of uncertainty about who's going to be doing what when so um but i will let you know as soon as i know what's happening when i will be doing the end of topic test but we'll be doing practice questions and sort of interactive activities next week and i will give you a heads up as soon as i know when the test will be okay any questions uh, leave it down in the comments